This is the Oxford group, but we get people from everywhere, from Massachusetts. Hello, Diana. Uh, okay. Oh, great. I'm glad to see so many people uh, turning up. At first, I wasn't the host or the co-host, so it looked as if there was no one coming. I was like... A bit disappointed <laughs> but luckily you are here so this evening's a little bit different from usual because uh due to inners actually who very kindly suggested that we dedicate this session to the situation and the people of myanmar um and i'm sure it hasn't escaped people's notice that there's you know a crisis going on right now um some people are calling it a kind of um face-off between moral power and violent power, you know. Um, and it's something that's very close to my heart, having lived in that country. It's also, you know, sometimes people think the monastics shouldn't really speak about these things. But for me, this is a human rights issue. It's not really a political issue. Um, we're talking about saving the lives of people, you know, and I think that's everybody's concern. Because the way I understand Buddhist practice is that, you know, virtue, includes action, virtue in action. And wherever we see suffering, we do what we can to help. We do what we can to alleviate that suffering, not only sit by and observe. So today I wanted to give a little bit of history about the situation and also a bit of history about our own lineage that we've inherited in the West, our um, Western Vipassana tradition or insight tradition. Um, as well as the modern mindfulness movement, because that all actually has its roots in, in Burma, the country which preserved the technique, but also preserved all the texts, you know, for generations with such diligence and care. Um, and also have a look at um, a little bit about the psyche of the Burmese people, as far as I understand from my time there, and maybe how that is now informing that the way they protest you know, with peace and with such incredible courage and resilience. And what we can learn from, you know, the way that they are using this uh, peaceful protest to overcome the evil of the military um, regime that's tried to seize power. Um, and finally, we'll have a look at how we might be able to help. So this will include not only donations, but ways that we can perhaps sign petitions or just encourage the Burmese people, reminding them they're not alone and looking out for each other, you know, especially if you do have Burmese friends, just checking in with them and seeing how they're doing right now. So I really want to stress that this does relate to all of us, obviously, because we're citizens of the world, but also just um, reminding us that we have such a huge debt of gratitude to what we call the golden land, yeah? because this really did preserve the teachings and the practices in their pristine purity, as my first teacher, Goenka, used to say, um, but also through so many different teachers and great Sayadors that have, have been there. So there's like the Ledi Sayador, who was one of the um, most renowned teachers, I think, in the late 1800s. And then there were Mogok Sayador, Mahasi Sayador, Sunun Sayador, who was my own teacher's teacher. And uh, yeah, so I lived there in Burma for probably about five years, but I made many visits there from 1997. And uh, my tradition, my first contact with the path was through um, the Goenka system. So I first came to meditation in India, but I was very aware that the roots of that practice came from Burma and were preserved by this lineage that went from Goenkaji to his teacher Ubakin and to his teacher Sayatetji, and then back to Ledi Sayador. And even um, the other main tradition in that country, the Mahasi uh, lineage, Mahasi Sayador's meditation methods that also many of us may have practiced, he also, his teacher was Mingun Sayador, and that traced back to Ledi Sayador too. And Ledi Sayador was really an interesting um, monastic because he was also a great scholar. And there's a book that you might want to check out if you're interested in this history um, by Eric Braun, and it's called The Birth of Insight, Meditation, Modern Buddhism, and the Burmese monk Ledi Sayador. And in that, it says that um, it was actually under British colonial rule 
that he started to fear the loss of the Buddhist tradition. <clears throat> and so he put in safeguards to preserve the Dhamma by actually empowering the lay community in their practice. So this was the first time really that certain practices had come down from the monastic Sangha to the general public. And apparently like just a few, I don't know how many years into his teaching, but by the early 1900s, there were um, tens of thousands of lay Buddhist groups engaged in like systematic study of the texts and the practices. And so he made it accessible to the lay people because he felt that they could preserve these practices and that would safeguard um, Buddhism against the colonial rule at that time. And so what we actually inherit now at places like IMS and through Gaia House is a kind of simplified version of what Lady Sayadaw was teaching. Yeah? And um, he didn't go so much into the deep meditation. He focused more on Panya, the wisdom practices, and rather than the Samadhi, the jhana practices. But we did inherit a kind of weak form of jhana practice in the insight tradition. So we can you know, get some sense of what these states are about. But also I think just for me, having come into contact with meditation and with the tradition in Burma itself, I had a sense of the scope and the depth of the practice. And um, it really changed my life, yeah. So even from my first retreat, I felt that I was going to ordain, I wanted to ordain when the time was right. And I knew that it would be in Burma because just stepping into that place, you can feel this sense of safety, first of all, as a woman, surprising perhaps to some, because it was a military dictatorship when I was living there. And also um, just a sense that everybody tries to observe the five precepts you know, the general citizens of that country. We can't say all of the military who are ruling that place, but the, the citizens are observing five precepts so diligently as though because of the great suffering, you know, and the oppression that they experienced, they really took a deeper refuge in the Dhamma and understood the Dhamma to be the only real way out of, of the suffering they were going through. And yet they would never, you know, complain. They would just take every opportunity to come to the monasteries and the retreat centers and, and practice as best they could. And you had these Burmese people who would just sit there like rocks, you know, and inspire everybody else to just go that bit deeper. And uh, they definitely had this sort of talent and gift for meditation, um, which really inspires me knowing how excellent, you know, they are in their meditation practice. It's incredibly heartening to see that that also can translate into peaceful and incredibly courageous activism. You know, one of the qualities and characteristics of the Burmese people is just this great humility and gentleness. They're really the friendliest, most gentle and, and loving people that I've really ever met in any country. And I've traveled very, very widely throughout Asia and other places. And it's really a testament you know, seeing the way they behave now, that even the most gentlest of people can have this great courage and inner resilience and strength that we might not expect. And amazingly, a lot of the women are the ones that are at the forefront of these um, protests at the moment. And I was listening to an interview today <clears throat> by one of my friends who's lived there for many, many years, and he's um, got a podcast called Insight Myanmar. And he was talking to a Burmese lady who was born in the UK, so she's British Burmese. And she was saying, why are people so surprised that the women are at the forefront? The Burmese women are bloody minded. They're really tough. They're really strong. And I think what gives them that strength, you know, from my experience in that country is the depth of their understanding about Buddhism. Um, and in a way, like I say, because they didn't have freedom in the political sphere or freedom of speech or you know they've been under this oppression for so long um they've really plunged into the practice and taken that as their refuge and it's really heartening to see this now so my own experience there i guess just some of the highlights living there um were spending a couple of months in 1997 um, in one of the Mahasi monasteries, which was uh, the first long retreat I did. And Burma is an amazing place if you want to deepen your practice. I mean, I don't know that there's anywhere else you can really go and immerse yourself and have all the conditions to support you in longer retreat, you know. 
we can get a taste of the practice over here, but it's very different to practice it in a Buddhist context where the whole country, in a sense, understands what we're doing, right? And uh, I guess one of the reasons I knew I'd ordain there was because you would just see monks and nuns everywhere in daily life. It was very clear that, you know, in life we have a choice to be uh, lay people or to be renunciants. There's this two different pathways, different ways of walking on the path. And the renunciant life happened to call me. So it never felt that I was sort of doing something odd, like in a little hidden corner in the West, looking a bit odd with my funny clothes and beanie. <laughs> it felt like I was entering like a holding, a massive holding field, part of something much, much bigger than myself. And that was what gave me the strength and the, um, the dedication, maybe the courage to renounce. You know, I, I, and the Burmese people looked after me in those years of my holy life. Yeah, there was another time before I ordained in 2000 that I was uh, there for the centenary of Sayaji Yubakin's, I think, death anniversary. I'm not quite sure now. It might have just been the centenary of his teaching. I actually don't remember. But there were hundreds, I think 800 meditators from around the world who came to Burma at that time and we used to meditate on the platform around the Shwedagon Pagoda, this huge group of people of every walk of life, of every colour, gender, you know, uh, background and we would be meditating there together on this kind of very cold hard marble floor but there was such an energy of meditation because the only thing that happens in that place is the respect and devotion to the Buddha, the practice and paying respect devotional offerings, chantings, that the marble would just seem to melt under the legs, even though it was very hard. I'd feel like I was sitting on air, you know, with this really charged energy that was so supportive in my practice. And then later in 2004 to about 2011, I ordained. 2004 was just the first time I still had to finish my studies in England. But um, during that time, the first thing my teacher said to me after I ordained is that he was going to send me on a pilgrimage and he literally just uh, phoned the meditation center where myself and three other nuns were, or was it four other nuns who decided to ordain together with me at that time? Uh, three of them Burmese and one was an English friend of mine. So there were five of us. And he phoned the meditation center. You're not supposed to do that because you're all on silent retreat. And he just said, right, I'm sending you to Lady Sayadaw's place. Then I'm sending you to Webu Sayadaw's place. And he just arranged the whole thing so that we'd be offered food along the way. And, uh, and we could go to these incredible places and get some of that energy. And uh, the Lady Sayadaw's place is actually, uh, is it, I think, Monwa. And I heard reports recently, it's very sad and it brings it home just how close this is that um i have a bikuni friend who's been living there and we spoke yesterday and she knows the trustees of that place and apparently the military ordered six youths uh, to get high on morphine and to go there and try and burn it down no. uh, uh, yeah and uh, and so somehow or other they managed to hold these people off but imagine the terror that they went through at that time so they did hold them off and they you know managed to I don't know how they did it but apparently the thought in their mind is that they want to stop these people from making bad karma for themselves they want to stop these people from doing something that will cause them so much suffering in the long run even amidst that terror and you know refusing to resort to violence themselves. And then in 2006, I ordained and, and stayed there for a long time. And I just had this sense, you know, that it was almost like being back in the time of the Buddha. There was this living lineage. There was this uh, monastic path that had been kept wide open. And I, I can't remember the statistics. It's over 600,000 monks and nuns in that country. It's probably many more. Um, and, you know, I just have such a deep sense of reverence and awe to all the people who preserve these opportunities and, and the fact that I had this chance now to practice in such a context. Um, and my teacher gave me such excellent conditions, even though I wasn't fully ordained, I had <clears throat> conditions to really practice deeply. We used to sit for 18 hours a day. And in many ways, it was idyllic in many ways. 
But of course, one of the issues with any military regime is that it does throw people into poverty. And, you know, when the Burmese, I think it was called the Burmese Liberation Army or something, or Burmese, I forget now, army took over in after colonial rule, they just weren't equipped to provide proper health and education to that country. And, you know, over the years, it became increasingly dictatorial. And now we have this thing called the Tatmadaw, which are the Burmese military now. So this was all there too, and there were problems for health and, you know, very, a lot of poverty around. And yet the people were still incredibly generous. So the monks would go on arms round every day to this village that was basically little huts, little shacks, you know, with a bit of um, woven sort of tatami for walls and just standing on stilts, little places. Sometimes the animals would live underneath. And uh, But every day the Burmese people would come out barefoot with a bowl of rice and just put something in that in that bowl. It was really mind blowing to see the, the generosity and the faith of the people. And yet, you know, I wasn't immune to the fact that there was this underlying tension. It was almost like a low grade prolonged trauma in the people, but also things that would affect my life. So <clears throat> I went on another pilgrimage with my teacher um, and we went to his places of birth and uh, his teachers, teachers places, which was incredibly inspiring as well. At one point we had to get on a bullock cart for about two hours because the not even a kind of jungle jeepney would get through that kind of thick um, remote place anymore. So it was really a trek. Um, but on the way back from there, we were trying to come back into, I think, Monoa and then Mandalay. Um, somehow the military got wind of it that there were foreigners in those areas, probably were the first white people to, to go to such villages. You know, they didn't have transport. Everything was on foot and, on, you know, just on animals, bullocks. And, um, and so we were being followed. So my teacher said, oh, you better get on this uh, bus and we got on that bus and we just had to go our own way. <laughs> Interestingly, that's actually, uh, we made it to Yangon separately. For my teacher and that's when I also met um, somebody who would become a great teacher to me or his friend anyway who put me in touch with a great teacher. Diana knows him, he's a uh, Sayadaw U uh, Jagara, a French Canadian monk who's lived there for many years. So there were all these kind of serendipitous things too but there was this cardinal rule you know that you would never never speak about politics, you could never mention Do Aung San Suu Kyi's name even if you would, you would always avoid driving anywhere near the place where she was under house arrest. I uh, again heard a report from somebody recently saying the same thing, that whenever they would drive there, they'd have to dock down in the car, you know, and this is Burmese people. I remember the first time that my main supporters actually said something about their feelings about it all, and it was in a car, because a car's a protected place, no one else can hear or suspect what's being said. And I felt it was a real, I really felt a sense of deep trust at that point that they dared to sort of confide. And then you kind of hear reports about people just disappearing, you know. They were going about their ordinary daily life one day, but the next day they were gone. And there was this prison called Insane Prison, very good name for such a terrible place. And, uh, you know, they had heaps and heaps of political prisoners in there, often not even political. At one point in our monastery in Burma, <coughs> we actually had a corner um, that became like a second prison camp. And it was because there was a prison in, I think, Yangon, and somehow they managed to seek permission to shift their camp to the monastery because they wanted, I guess, it was better conditions for them, right? So my teacher put a huge area together for them and they had their kind of prison camp with, with walls, well, like makeshift kind of wooden fencing around it and they grew vegetables and they would come and work in the monastery like um, hacking at rocks and things like that and I remember there was a Dutch woman who stayed came to visit and she said this is terrible how can a, a monk and a monastery like allow prisoners but for them it was such a relief to be in a safe place and to be fed every day with food that was far far better than what they were having there and of course not to be tortured because that would be what happened in those prisons they were notorious for being tortured there was a woman who quoted recently she said i was mistreated in prison 
but my only concern was not to mistreat and develop anger towards those people mistreating me and that that person would not suffer from their bad actions. It's just incredible how they can put other people's well-being ahead of their own. In a sense, it's ahead of their own or at least equal to because they understand they're all victims of this regime. So I also had a friend who was um, a supporter and also she just became a good friend and her husband was, um, I think, a sergeant in the army. He was conscripted. I mean, you don't have a choice. Um, and he was an alcoholic because he just couldn't bear what he had to do. And I'm not sure that he ever had to actually harm another person, but I know he was tortured mentally by being in that situation. And finally, he had some kind of foot injury, something that served as an excuse to be able to get out. And you could see it, he used to come to our monastery like probably every month, the Burmese people would flood into the monastery and, and take these 10 day retreats that be, we had a capacity for about 80 people in the Dhamma Hall, but it would usually be about 400 people literally and we'd have to use like the dining hall as well and the dumb hall became like a, a dormitory and we'd have to sit outside on a kind of platform that my teacher was starting to build he was actually making it into a pagoda so they'd sit outside instead so we'd have like this huge swelling of the monastery and he used to come and he would ordain for 10 days during those retreats uh, many, many lay people used to come. There'd be like this sea of black hair on the steps of the ordination hall where, you know, whole groups of people would come and try to do the best they could with that limited time, those limited holidays. I think not every 10 days, but every month there was a 10 day retreat. So you'd get different people coming. But um, during the major festivals, Tinjan, I think it's in April, very hot. Um, we'd get this huge influx of people. And one of my jobs was to, um, to serve and to manage on those retreats. So to keep you know, people to the schedule and to make sure their needs were met, to make sure they had everything, uh, to be as comfortable as they could be, and uh, to show them you know, where to go for food, et cetera, to sweep a little bit in the morning. And uh, those retreats were very strictly silent. And I remember the people would come into the hall and sit like rocks, you know, they just wouldn't move an inch. But then in the breaks, we'd sort of, you know, happen to be next door and we'd hear all this talking. And I'd go into their rooms and try and say, you know, Ariamon, like, please, this is silent, you know. <laughs> and uh, sometimes they, I could understand a bit of Burmese and they'd say, what? Even in the breaks, we have to be silent in the breaks. I say, yeah, <laughs> you know, it's a meditation retreat. But then I realized that they planned to have parties in the breaks. They would come to the monasteries with all this um, food and tea, lepeto. I know Tint, a few of you here are Burmese. <laughs> They'd bring all their lepeto, which is like pickled tea leaf salad with nuts and all sorts of nice, yummy, crunchy things, crunchy seeds and beans and pickled tea. And uh, they'd get it out in the breaks and they'd just chat. And after a while, I realized that this was a safe place. This was a place they could actually let off some of that tension, some of that, you know, fear and those feelings of oppression. And after I realized that, I never asked them to be silent anymore. Because you know? the, the amazing thing was they could still come to the hall and meditate. And who knows, perhaps that's why, right? Because they actually had a chance to connect with each other in a safe place and feel like they weren't under threat. But military people would come and meditate too. You know, military people would pay respect and give huge donations to the monastery. So, you know, it was really a situation where in a sense, everyone was a victim of the people at the top. Isn't it so often the case? Power just corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Is a forget who quoted that, but that's not my quote. <laughs> but you can really see how that's happening. So now, what's happened. In 2011, they managed to regain a modicum of democracy and Aung San Suu Kyi was free from house arrest. But I think what we often don't realize in the West is that it was never really democracy. It was a step towards it, but the military still had a huge amount of power. I read something somewhere that said about 20% of the, of the um, seats but also they managed to have a clause in the constitution whereby if they weren't happy with anything or if somebody does something that, you know, like have a walkie talkie or some stupid thing they make up, they can basically revoke 
the right to safety and freedom of speech. And apparently in the wake of the cyclone, I was there during the cyclone Nagi, Nagis in 2008, apparently in the wake of that, they put in new legislation to ensure they could revoke, you know, any kind of democracy. So it's very, very complicated. And what you're hearing about now is, you know, young people who are standing up to this because they have enjoyed freedom, relative freedom of relative democracy, a relatively globalized Myanmar, you know, with, with internet connections. We didn't have much of that when I was there. You had to sneak up to like one cafe in Yangon. I'd go there for half an hour a month. And in the end, it was actually closed down by the military, yeah. So now they were, you know, they're, they, they're different. They've grown up in a different society. These are people I've never met. I mean, I left in 2010 and it was 2011 that, you know, they actually got a modicum of democracy back. So I think what happened is that the generals have seized power through some, you know, strange clause in the constitution and basically through force, but they haven't really reckoned with the, the different culture that's in the psyche of the people now. And this gives me some hope, and I hope it gives the Burmese people some hope. By Burmese people, I mean all people, because it's important to say that the civil um, democracy movement is a movement for all. And, you know, even the Rohingya people, they are Burmese, they are Myanmar people. And apparently there are photographs of them in the camps, you know, with the raised uh, fingers for um, civil disobedience. And there's also reports which are very encouraging about um, some of the Burmese people realizing that they were fed all this propaganda through the military, you know, trying to um, bring about fear of the Rohingya and the same thing that always happens, isn't it, in every society? You know, our tabloid media try and instill fear that, you know, it's the foreigners taking our jobs. And so the Burmese people were kind of brainwashed and now they're saying we are so, so sorry for this. We didn't realize. And uh, there's this uh, Catholic nun, I think, oops, I forgot to bring the quote, but um, she was demonstrating, she was begging the generals to stop the violence and to cause you know cause ceasefire and uh, I read a report from her later that obviously it didn't work too well although it may have de-escalated things for a moment in time but she said look you know I'm human I'm still scared but there's no way I'm going to stop this we've got to come together and this is the time to lay aside all notions of divisions like based on race ethnicity, religion, mostly it's not religious um, dispute, it's um, problems with different ethnic groups. And uh, I don't know enough about it to talk about it in detail, but I know Innes works with some of those minority groups. But I think this civil um, democracy movement in a way could bring people together, could bring people together who are united against the military, because that really is the issue here. They've never really had a chance to live in a democracy and resolve, you know, differences, resolve conflicts in, in a normal way. And so what we're seeing now, I wanted to just talk a bit about how we can be inspired and, and how um, people's understanding of Buddhism is informing the way that they are standing up. And I think one of the first things is that we can see um, their incredible generosity you know it's a country that's um that really practices dana what we call generosity not only dana to the monastic sangha but generosity of heart generosity of spirit and there are even pictures somewhere of monks giving food and giving water to the protesters so you know even though the sangha the monastic sangha is seen as a field of merit the burmese people don't hold that rigidly they understand the essence of that practice and they look after each other there were also some very moving reports about protesters even giving water and food to the military who they were standing face to face with you know in fear of their life and they were saying you know come on let's just have a drink of water let's cool off a bit here you know, and, and encouraging them with loving kindness by saying, you know, you are human, you have family, I'm human, I have family, let's, you know, none of us want to harm, you don't want to do things that harm yourself and harm others, and speaking to them in these ways. Imagine having the moral courage to still, 
not only preserve your own sea level and integrity, but to encourage others to improve theirs. You know, these people who we see as the enemies. Um, and yet this regime is so brutal that there are also photos coming out of, there was one man who gave the, the military some food from his stall and then the next photo showed them beating him from behind as he walked away. So I don't want to underestimate and, you know, underplay how brutal the regime is because I really want us to think about ways that we can help. But at the same time, you know, the Burmese people understand, I think, that it's better to die with virtue in the heart than to actually resort to something that will cause much more long-term harm. And so their understanding of cause and effect of karma, you know, that it's the quality of our intention that counts. And it's the quality of our intention that can, you know, lead to wholesome action of body and speech or to actions of body and speech that harm. And they understand this not only as something that has immediate effects, but also that has effects for, future lives and I think this is what also gives them a, a really big perspective on this situation and you hear people saying you know I'm willing to die for this because we have to be the last generation that go through such pain such trauma such a nightmare you know where people are just living in fear for their lives there are people who are you know now they're having night raids almost every night and the military aren't discriminating like oh you were in the protest we'll raid you and punish you and torture you and arrest you they're just raiding everybody's house anybody's house and making arrests and sometimes apparently they're being paid to release people they've arrested other times someone's not so lucky and they never get released huh? So you can see how this poverty and this desperation, this brainwashing also feeds into this whole situation. And yet these Burmese people are still trying to um, encourage them to lay down the weapons, you know, put those weapons aside. And I think it's through this peacefulness and this commitment to non-harm that they really are winning the respect of the world. And gradually, I think this movement has to gain momentum and the other thing that's important here is that, you know, often we think of Sila, the first precept not to kill, as just not killing, right? But it goes further than that into protecting life. And for anyone who says, you know, Buddhists shouldn't be involved in such things, I mean, the Burmese people are really an example of applied Dhamma, of applied Buddhism in a situation of life and death. You also had a report of monks in Mandalay uh, sitting out and meditating uh, in the area where protesters had been shot the day before and they were just peacefully sitting and, and protesting with no armor except you know their robe that's all they have sure you know blessing chantings can be protective but they know that won't stop the bullets from taking their lives so this is one of the things this uh, the virtue and commitment to non-harm but i also think that it's right view and an understanding and acceptance of reality as it is that helps give them the strength of mind to respond in a wise, compassionate way. You know, they understand suffering, the cause of suffering, and that this is an inevitable part of life. And the Burmese people have suffered a lot. You know, they understand about separation. We all have to be separated from those we love. We have to be associated with the disliked. They understand this. And I think, by when we can allow that, when we can actually embrace that to a certain extent, we have more flexibility of mind to choose a response. And so they're responding with some clarity um, and obviously a lot of moral courage. And as I say, this understanding that we have to be separated from all we love. There are also some incredibly moving photos of mothers giving a blessing to their teenage or early, you know, 20 year old children who have decided to go and protest because they don't feel that life's worth living under that regime. My friend who I mentioned, who's a bikuni, she actually just left the country. She's from New Zealand and she just managed to get out. Uh, it was very difficult to get a uh, uh, quarantine in New Zealand in a government uh, place because there's a kind of massive waiting list. So she had to contact the top people in government in that country to get quarantine and to get out of the country and um, she said that she was also really good friends with somebody uh, I think it's in Mamio where she was in the north 
and uh, they had 60 employees of people who are under 30. And apparently all those employees, except for three or four, said that they're willing to give their life, they're gonna go out and protest because it's simply not worth living under such a regime. So it's not only that it's not worth living for them, but they're also thinking about people that they'll never even meet, people in the future, you know, who they want to protect. So I wanted to say some inspiring things too, because this is kind of a heavy subject. And I guess, you know, there are some hopeful signs such as some of the generals have defected. I think one of the ones in quite a high position of power and other ones are also defecting. Some have gone to India um, as refugees, political refugees, you know, separated from their family. Um, and the reports I'm reading do sort of seem to say that it's the momentum that counts. And so when we're thinking about what we can actually do from the outside, there's a lot we can do because every little counts. And I think obviously one of the first things is to have compassion for the protesters who are risking their lives by perhaps helping to donate towards their protective equipment, protective gear. Um, you know, people are kind of coming together on the streets to form safe places, resting spaces, barricades, um, to give medicine, you know, nurses and doctors are, are just working freely around the clock to help people who are injured. So we can uh, provide some financial support and we're going to give you links, but there's also petitioning our governments, you know, to stand up and take a stand and the UN, we can write letters to the UN we can write stuff on our social media platforms. We can reach out to our Burmese friends. One of the Burmese protesters on the front line that I heard mentioned in an interview said that the most important thing that we can do is give them emotional support. And the person interviewing them was surprised by that because they thought it would be the physical things, but they said just that we know the world is with us. We, you know, it gives us incredible strength to keep going. It just gives us that strength. I mean, they're not sleeping, right? They protest by day, they're raided by night, hiding, hiding out at night. So, you know, just asking your friends how they are, if you have any Burmese friends or people you know who are connected with that land um, can be really important. Even if you don't know them, you can make them friends. And I think staying up to date as well with what's happening through reliable sources. So in the email following up from this, we're going to send you a link to um, this lay Burmese woman's page. She's the English woman I mentioned and she was born in England. Um, and she has various ways and um, connections that you can trust, ways of getting involved and also some of the history in more depth you know, obviously she understands it to a much greater degree than I, I do. And uh, sometimes that can help us get a context for what's going on. And I think lastly, I'd like to say that, you know, it's so important when we're faced with these kind of global situations to guard ourselves from hate, to guard ourselves from resentment and from, you know, obviously we can see who the oppressors and who the oppressed are in this case, but to understand that everyone is a victim of a terrible regime. As I said, you know, most of the time the people who join are either conscripted out of choice, you know, the government go into very poor villages where people haven't got jobs, they're scraping to survive, and they give them jobs in the military. And I don't think they often have much of a choice to say no. The other thing that happened with these prisoners at um, my monastery, I asked my Sayadaw, you know, like, what have they done? Why are they there? And he said, oh, petty crime casino you know and it was very notable to see that they were all very young very fit and quite well educated young people huh? so they were just making excuses to take them away and out of education out of being productive members of society to put them into these camps where they really couldn't do very much and then you know obviously the lack of education that comes from having poor education and health services etc and just delusion, basic delusion, right, of the human mind that we're so susceptible to brainwashing. Sometimes there's this need to belong also. So apparently I heard that some of the chief military actually used tactics like trying to starve the people of the police on the ground to make them go a little bit crazy 
and uh, do barbarous deeds that no human being in their right mind could do. So imagine that sort of separation from your own inner goodness, the degree to which you've really gone off course um, for things to get that way, you know. And even when they're being pleaded with not to take life, sometimes they're just saying, we're only following orders, you know. This is brainwashing. This is brainwashing and fear. Hmm? So they're all living in fear. But I hope, you know, that this time it will be different because, as I say, they seize the power very hastily. And I don't think they accounted. I read an analysis of it actually by some people who know what they're talking about. And, uh, you know, it may be that they didn't account for this younger generation being so well connected and well resourced, so creative in their approaches, and also really not willing to go through this again. They feel it's now or never, they've got to take back the democracy, they've got to turn things around. Mm. Eight, eight decades is a long time to be under military rule. So there are doctors, students, civil servants, all kinds of people in the protests, you know, and they're fighting not only, as I say, they're not only protesting peacefully for um, democracy, but also for uh, marginalized groups, for the rights of the marginalized minorities and for LGBTQIA as well. So this is a different generation now, and I think it gives me quite a lot of hope. So I just want to say for any Burmese people particularly who are listening to not lose courage not lose hope because people are with you I, don't, I think most of the world is with you and you know you're on the right side of virtue you know that doing good begets good whether in the short or the long term that's the way of the comma that's the way of the natural law you know and as Nelson Mandela said he has this lovely quote he said make your choices reflect your hopes and not your fears and you can see the difference there, yeah? You make your choices reflecting your hopes and not your fears. And to us as meditators, I just want to encourage you to, you know, see this as your cause too. We inherited what we have. For some of, the, for some of us, it's the most life-changing thing we've ever come across is the Dhamma, you know, in, in whatever form. But certainly through this tradition, the insight tradition, you know, this hails back, it has its roots in Burma. And if the light goes out in Burma, you know, the whole world will be impoverished in terms of Dhamma because nowhere else is it maintained and being practiced to such a depth. And as I say, you know, what an incredible place to be able to go and to deepen our own practice, whether as monks and nuns or whether as lay people who want to have longer retreats. Yeah, you'll never find kinder people. You'll never find such incredible conditions to really understand this thing called suffering and the way out, the way out for good. This is the rich, richness of Burma. This is the real richness and long may it be preserved. So, I hope that there was something there that could be educational or insightful or helpful for you. Um, and, I wanted to do some meditation practice now, because that is also one way that we can support the people and support ourselves. I know I'm quite affected by what's happening because I feel such a strong connection. Burma, it's almost like I feel I took my second birth in Burma, my birth into the holy life. So it's important to keep ourselves resourced. And also if we are resourced and we, we do recognize our privilege, you know, even being able to speak freely like this, some of the time we just don't realize what we have by living in a safe country where we're not going to be killed for simply differing in our political views. Yeah. Some people say, oh yeah, but it's not really a democracy here. We don't have that much freedom. But really when you look at it on a scale, I think it's time we woke up <laughs> to our privileges and actually use those privileges to help those who are living in the darkness and living literally 24 hours in fear. So let's see if we can resource ourselves a bit through the practice of metta and, uh, and then we'll spread metta and we'll particularly focus on the people of Myanmar, all people in that place, including the Rohingyas who have been you know, uh, who fled to Bangladesh, hopefully 
these things will all heal under a different regime, we can hope. And then I'll end by dedicating the merits. So I'll do a little Pali blessing chant at the end. So if you wanna have a stretch, please do so. I'm gonna have a little swig of my cup of tea and just take time to find a comfortable position Really take time now, slowing down. So that was a lot. And it will have generated certain reverberations, resonances for you. So just sitting and maybe taking a few deep breaths. And letting each out breath bring you into deeper connection with the ground. Sometimes it's nice to take a really deep breath in as though you're drinking in the air and sigh, let it out. And the first part of the meta practice is in just coming in contact with your body and asking your body how it feels. Whether there's anything you can do to make your body more comfortable and at ease. So not just assuming that your body's already in the best position for you. But going that little bit further to listen in free up perhaps a bit more space between your ankles and your shins or between your shoulders, rolling them back. Noticing if anything's constricting or tight, the buttocks may be squished or pressed, you can give them a bit more space or if you have a belt or any tight piece of clothing, you could also loosen that. So this starts to show the body that it's in the presence, the friendly presence of the mind. The presence of the mind that just takes time to inquire and to care. rather than pushing your body around. So I like to start by establishing a sense of mindful awareness. Imagining it as though I'm turning on the lights in the mind. And along with that, an intention of kindness, which is like the warmth of the sun. So the mindfulness is like the light, kindness is like the warmth. And you imagine that sunshine spreading through your body through each and every cell. Starting from the top of the head or the tips of the toes, however you wish. So that wherever your awareness meets any sensation, any feeling in the body, it also imbues that feeling with kindness and care.
Relaxing any tensions, tightness, holding. Allowing you to settle more fully into this moment with ease. Imagining this golden light spreading to each and every part of the body. You don't need to name or label any part of the body, just feeling into the experience, what it means to have a body. And whether sensations are agreeable, pleasant or disagreeable, maybe even neutral, places where you don't feel very much at all, whatever it is, embracing, suffusing it with the same kindness, attention and care. Noticing how that care, that kindness relaxes, eases the body, eases any tension, whether physical or mental. Just embracing and accepting. doing a ceasefire with your body and mind. If you wish to continue just suffusing yourself with this kind awareness, please do so. If you want to join in a more formal meta practice, then feel free to take up the invitation. We're going to start with ourselves. So see if you can just tune in to any sensations in your body, maybe in the area of the chest, if that's comfortable for you, which are fairly pleasant, light, agreeable, easy to be with. And staying connected to those feelings, gently offer yourself thoughts of loving kindness, such as may I be happy, anxiety free, may I be healed, Live with kindness and with ease. You can choose your own phrases that resonate for you. And as you say each phrase, see if you can really tune into the meaning of that phrase. And then wait, pause in the silence 
before planting the next intention in the heart. So that your mind has time to incline towards the experience, the resonance, the felt sense of the meaning of those words. May I be happy. Anxiety free. May I be healed. Live with kindness and ease. Repeating the phrases in your own time. Trusting in the power of that intention to bring about love and kindness. When the conditions are ripe. Now imagining this loving kindness growing inside. And spreading beyond your body to everyone in this room. As though a golden light in your heart were now spreading outward, shining on it all the way the sun shines impartially on all beings, lighting them up, warming them, bringing them well-being and ease. So imagining all of us here sharing this beautiful loving kindness, basking in its golden glow. And as we share that metta, it starts to grow. Noticing any pleasant sensation, even a slight softening in the heart, or a deepening sense of relaxation and peace, maybe tingling, lightness. And enjoying that feeling, allowing it to relax the heart and mind. I 
And our combined metta starts flowing even beyond the people joined together in this Zoom room, flowing outward. Like really powerful golden light. Until it comes to rest on the country of Myanmar. Almost like a spotlight on that land. Or if you feel a different perception works, you might imagine the metta like a huge container that includes all the people in the golden land. Imagine it shining down on all beings in that country. Sending our loving kindness specifically to the protesters, the brave young women and men who maintain peace, non-harm, May they be protected by the power of this loving kindness. May they have courage, resilience and strength. May they be safe. free from fear. And may goodness prevail. May they know they're not alone, but that we're all thinking of them whole in our hearts with loving kindness as many people around the world do the same. And our metta spreads now also to all the fallen heroes, those who've been injured or killed. May their goodness be a cause for a favorable rebirth. May their families find peace. May we continue to celebrate their lives and take inspiration from their courage. May no more beings come to home. And our meta shines also on the military and the police, spreading impartially in the same way the sun shines on all beings without discriminating the good or the bad.
May all the military and police, victims of poverty, of fear and delusion, may they regain their senses and immediately see the error of their ways. May they have the courage to lay down their weapons. May they come to know the beautiful Dhamma that their own countries preserved for so many years. May all beings on all sides of this, all ethnic minorities, all religions, people of all genders, every age, may they all be free from suffering, free from fear, May they all recognize their common humanity and learn to live in peace. And really shining that metta, that golden light on Myanmar, all her people, the people Rohingya people across the border who had to flee. May they all be reunited, all live in peace. And spreading our metta now even beyond any particular group or nation to include this entire world even the entire universe, all living beings, wherever they may be. All beings who struggle with greed, hatred and delusion, may we all be free. May we develop loving kindness to all beings, just as a mother to her only child. Just imagine for a moment how it would be if we could all stop the war, stop the struggle, stop hurting each other and look upon each other with eyes of loving kindness, just for a, a moment in time. Imagine that. Imagine the faces, smiling people, the animals running free, birds in the sky, the insects, creatures of the sea, all beings, where they all live in freedom, in harmony and in peace. May we all come in contact with this beautiful Dhamma and be fully liberated from all suffering. So I'm going to chant a little metta blessing for all of us here and then after that dedicate the merits of this meditation. So for now just absorbing these words, words that I learned from my teacher in Burma 
and letting that metta really soak through. Drenching you with loving kindness. Sabe sata Sabe pana Sabe buta Sabe pogala Sabe ata bawa pariapana Sabe itio Sabe poisa Sabe aria Sabe anavia Sabe deva Sabe manusa Sabe wini parika Aweva hontu Abya paja hontu Aniga hontu Sukiatanam bavihavantu Dukha munjantu Yadalada sampatito Mawe gachantu Kama saka so Keeping your eyes closed we're now going to do another little Buddhist chant. And just imagine all that goodness in your heart, all those good intentions, even from a single phrase of metta, of loving kindness. Any goodness in your heart right now. All the blessings of your life so far. Imagine dedicating those, sharing those with others. And in this case, with all the people in Myanmar, Sharing our merits with all those people. Akasata Chapumata Devanaka Maidika Punyanta Marumodetua Chiram Rakan to Sasanam Akasata Chapumata Deva naka mahitika punyanta manu mode tua chiram rakantu de sanam akasata chapumata Deva naka mahitika punyanta manu mode tua chiram rakantu mamparan Itam mania tinam hortu, Sikito hon to nyatayo. Itam mania tinam hortu, Sikita hon to nyatayo. Itam mania tinam hortu, Sikita hon to nyatayo. That means may those who dwell in space and earth, the invisible beings, the devas and the nagas, rejoice with this merit and protect the preservation of Buddhism, the teachings, the Dhamma, myself and all beings. And may any goodness, any merit, blessings that I've accumulated in my life go to all my relatives maybe our blood relatives, our ancestors, maybe all beings we can consider our relatives in birth, sickness, aging and death. May all those relatives be happy and well. Very good. Hmm. 
Thank you so much. <laughs> May whatever little we've been able to do, and we can still perhaps do, May that all go for the welfare of all beings in Burma and beyond. And be a great support for our practice too. So we still have a few minutes left and uh, I'd like to open up if anybody has anything they'd like to share, add, say, uh, complain about or suggest <laughs> anything goes anything goes i'm not an expert on these matters but uh, <laughs> in terms of practice uh, we can discuss whatever you like yeah also if there are any burmese people who would like to say anything or maybe inners also she's lived there a long time anything you'd like to share tint I asked you to unmute. Um, yeah. Did it work? Yeah. Good evening, vulnerable. Thank you so much for the chanting. And uh, I just want to let you know uh, when you are doing chanting, I hold the map of Burma and I put it on my heart and I can feel that, that you are middle. It covered and encompassed the whole country and I feel in my perspective, I think it's very effective and it made me feel a bit of ease. And thank you so much. Thank you for your practice. That's really kind of you. So that this is how we can support each other, right? When we thank practice you. together, it gets strengthened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for as, sharing. Thank you. As you said, the emotional support is the most important and it's a very precious. Thank you. Okay, please let me know also however I can support you. Yeah, however else I can. Hmm. Anybody else? Is that the lady with the Hawaii? Did you have your hand up? I'm not sure what your name is. I'll unmute you. I think I asked you. You should be able to. Unmute yourself. Not yet. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. I want Hi. to thank you for that beautiful chanting. Uh, it was very, very touching. And also for your talk um, on Burma. I come from a country where I know very well of oppression, of people being tortured, of suffering, of innocent people. So your talk meant a lot to me. But there is something that has bothered me about Burma. And this goes back to uh, one or two years ago, when I saw a newsreel, of um, the uh, violence against the uh, Rahundas, uh, there were a number of uh, Burmese monks, or at least what they look like being monks in the monks' robes, also practicing the, the uh, violence and oppression. And and that baffled me very much. I couldn't understand it. And I put this to a friend of mine who is a Buddhist. And she explained it to me as um, they were probably soldiers, etc., dressed as Buddhist monks in order to blacken the name of the, or the image of the monks. I, th that explanation, yes, it was an explanation, but it still didn't make me understand. I wonder if you could possibly make me I understand. I can try. Um, there is a very terrible movement in Burma um, called the Mahabata, 
And it's a fundamentalist religious group. I wouldn't even call it Buddhist because as you said in the beginning, someone who promotes, encourages or perpetrates violence is not a Buddhist monk. You know, this is exactly. absolutely against the precept. But, um, you know, like in any religion, you'll have people who understand the teaching and people who don't. And unfortunately there has been this like very right wing fundamentalist kind of wing um, with one very notorious monk who's been in prison several times and he's leading that movement. I mean, he shouldn't be a monk. And the Sangha council, the people at the head of the Sangha in Yangon, they've already, you know, outlawed that group and made it clear that they're not Buddhist and, you know, they don't support them and they should be kind of not considered Buddhist, but they keep coming back under different names. So I think that they are um, racist, you know, they had an agenda against the Rohingyas and, but they kind of were very clever by trying to go to all the villages, to the poor places, to the poor people and give them Buddhist education. So they appear to be providing education and hospitals and even promoting females, like empowering women, empowering nuns. But the other agenda was very evil. Um, and they were kind of colluding with the military as well. So I guess, I mean, no one can ever really know what's going on in somebody's mind. But for me, these are not monks. And there were documentaries made as well. I mean, fairly superficial, but still there were some documentaries made in England um, and they interviewed these monks and they were just speaking with hate. You know, I mean, not in the tones of anybody who had developed any meta in their art. So, but at the same time, it can be the case that the military sometimes dress up as, as monks. And I've heard that that's happening now. And what was happening now is that some of the military were dressing up as monks or getting other people like ordinary citizens to dress up as monks and go and provoke the protesters. So start beating the protesters and trying to provoke the protesters into anger so that the protesters would then beat the monk and then they could record it and say, look, the protesters are against Buddhism. The protesters are hitting monks. But fortunately the protesters are so strong in their commitment to nonviolence, such moral integrity that they didn't fight back. They knew the trick and they didn't, they abstained. But yeah, I mean, if there's robes everywhere, then anyone can anyone can feign to be a monk, unfortunately, or a nun, it doesn't as often happen. So I hope that people don't lose faith in the Buddha's teachings because of this, because we should always be very circumspect before trusting anybody, whether in the robes or not. You know, we have to be um, very careful, you know, because just because you put on a different color robe does not, it's not a sign of your spiritual progress. And the Buddha made it clear that the laity should admonish also the Sangha, we should watch the Sangha closely and we should, you know, pull them up where they're straying. So this is one of the reasons that we live on alms food because you'll only feed us if we live up to our precepts, hopefully. So anyway, I hope that says something, but, um, yeah, Thank please you. don't lose faith in, in Buddhism or in monastics because of a few bad eggs. No, I have. <laughs> it's a very, very common yeah. case. Thank you. Thank you so much, and Rotunda, and thank you to everyone for tonight. Uh, I know that um, there is so much in the world in general, in our personal lives at the moment, that really deserves attention, compassion, and, and practical support. But maybe just for now, uh, I would really like to ask you, if possible, just to reserve some of that compassion and attention to and keep uh, in your heart and in your mind uh, uh, the people in, in Myanmar, everyone, whatever their religion, the ethnic group, wherever they are, whether in Myanmar or outside, especially for their courage. And also perhaps as part of that, it would be good if the dana for, for this session would do, be donated to, to Myanmar. And there will be a, a link on you in the chat and the same link has been sent to you in the invitation to tonight. And it, it is a collection of ways in which you can donate to various um, at, um, to various organizations and individuals. And, and I'm confident that whatever you donate will be used 
either for the protesters themselves or for some of the specific services like the health services or for the CDM, the civil disobedience movement, because as you know, many people, workers, civil servants had, had, had chosen, decided to dedicate themselves to the movement. And so they have no salaries. Um, so there are various ways in which you can donate and it's, they are in, this, uh, in those links. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd just like to say thank you because, you know, we, we talked about this and you mentioned you wanting to do this and it's just so... You can't hear me? You can hear me. I just want to thank you really for coming up with this idea and giving um, us all the opportunity to learn a bit about the situation and to feel that we can be of some support. So thank you so much. And also to everyone who joined and to, of course, Oxford Insight who who agreed to do this and um, to everyone who joined because it's wonderful to see that people care so much. It's thank you, Candice. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Okay. Thank you. Take care, everybody. We'll say good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bante. <laughs> Did you want to speak, Tint? Did you want to say something? Thank you and good night, Vulnerable. Oh, okay. one thing I think is really blessing that we witness a nun and a monk. It's so wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank nice. you. Bye. Nice. Bye. <laughs> bye. Oh, by the way, oh. Vulnerable Center, where are you? why are you stay right now? Uh, now I'm also in Oxford, but I'm um, in Cowley, near Cowley. Not oh. very far from you, actually. But because of COVID, I haven't come to see you and I haven't invited the monks here. One time, Venerable Damasami came for Dana and also he invited me there for Dana, which was very, very lovely. Oh. Um, but maybe when the COVID restriction changes, then oh, uh, yeah. we can meet. Yeah. Yeah. In